As I sit here in my prison cell, I can't help but feel like I'm living in a movie. Except there's no plot or structure, just the endless monotony of my days in here. So I decided to create my own screenplay based on my experiences, and I titled it Monster, after the name the prosecutor called me during my trial. The trial started on Monday, July 6th, and lasted until the verdict was announced on Friday, July 17th. Each day was a roller coaster of emotions and stress as I sat through witness after witness testifying against me. I remember the first day vividly as I made my journey to the courthouse from the Manhattan Detention Center. I tried to keep my mind occupied by noting the camera angles and other technical details of the scene, as if I was directing a film. But as I arrived at the courthouse, my lawyer, Kathy O'Brien, delivered the devastating news that the prosecutor, Sandra Petricelli, was seeking the death penalty against me for murder. I knew I was innocent, but the evidence was stacked against me. Two older men, James King and Bobo Evans, had committed the robbery and shooting. But because I was there as a lookout, I was also legally culpable for murder. The witnesses against me were career criminals who had been promised reduced sentences in exchange for their testimony, and I couldn't help but question their credibility. Throughout the trial, I listened to the testimonies, but my mind would often flash back to my childhood, full of violence and fear. The sounds of fighting and gang rape echoed through the detention center at night, reminding me of the danger that surrounded me. As the trial progressed, I became increasingly aware that others saw me as a monster. My lawyer, the jury, and even my own father, who came to visit me, seemed to view me with suspicion and disgust. The weight of their judgment was crushing, and I began to feel like I was already serving a life sentence. But I held on to the hope that the truth would prevail. I sat through each day of the trial, my heart racing with anticipation, as witnesses testified for or against me. The medical examiner's testimony about the extent of Mr. Nesbitt's injuries horrified me, but it seemed to have little effect on the rest of the court. On the day that I took the stand, I knew that the impression I made was more important than telling the truth. So I denied ever going into the drugstore on the day in question, even though I knew it wasn't true. But I wasn't the only one who spoke on my behalf. Mr. Sawicki, my film teacher from school, appeared as a character witness, testifying to my character and decency. It was a rare moment of hope in an otherwise bleak and hopeless situation. When the verdict was finally announced on Friday, July 17th, my heart was pounding in my chest. I held my breath as the jury read out their decision. Not guilty. The weight of the world lifted off my shoulders, and I knew that I was finally free. Looking back on the trial, I can't help but feel a sense of injustice. I was innocent, but the color of my skin and the neighborhood I grew up in had made me an easy target for the authorities. It's a feeling that haunts me to this day, but I know that I have to keep fighting against injustice wherever I see it.